Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, June 21st regular meeting of the school committee. If everyone could please rise, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I will just go over the agenda for tonight quickly for people who don't have it in front of it. We will start off with a couple of recognitions, then we will have our first opportunity for public comment. We have reports to the school committee, including student council, liaison reports, a technology and Chromebook report, end of year reports on the high school guidance, the acting superintendent's report, and the school committee chair report. And then we have some new business, including adult education revolving account consolidation, field hockey overnight trip, nature's classroom, paraprofessional requests at the Marathon Elementary School, then future agenda items and school committee office hours, followed by old business, oh, I'm sorry, also the school committee website link updates, followed by old business uh, relating to the school committee liaison and roles and the year end balance report. We will then have our second opportunity for public comment and then go into items by consensus. So we'll start out with uh, recognitions. All right, so I will be quick. Um, I have a couple of recognitions. One is for the elementary school bu building committee. Uh, if you attended the ribbon cutting at the Marathon Elementary School, you know that it was a momentous occasion and it was evident how much work the Elementary School Building Committee has done over the last couple of years. And so just a shout out to them for all that they have done in creating a beautiful school that came in under time and under budget. And um, along those same lines, Craig Hay was there that day and he brought student musicians with him and we wanna thank Craig and the student musicians for um, the music on that day and uh, just for being there with us, it was wonderful. Then we had one more recognition and that's Bob Hamilton who has tirelessly come to all of our meetings for a number of years now um, and just wanna thank Bob and all of the HCAM crew, but Bob in particular is here. We also had uh, something small to give Bob so that over the summer when things are a little quieter, he can continue to think about how much we appreciate him. So I'm gonna just bring that back for you, Bob. Oh, hey, look at that, the camera shifted to him. Are there any other uh, recognitions that are not included on the agenda that we want to shout out publicly tonight? I have one. Um, this is the the Elmwood School. We had the International Night. I thought it was a fantastic effort made by uh, the <coughs> Elmwood Diversity Committee led by Mrs. Abaraju and Mrs. Ruffling and so many other um, staff members as well as community members. I thought it was a fantastic way of celebrating the diversity and uh, I think it also spoke to the unity within the diversity so it was fabulous. The food, the music and the kids coming up and make, you know doing all the performances, it was just fabulous. So, huge I, shout out. I was impressed with the kids getting up and performing in front of all those people. That that's, too. It was a great night so uh, and great opportunity for them to highlight some of their own cultural heritage. So. Mm -hmm. okay. And along those lines, I just wanted to say, um, especially that the, the year has ended now, the last day of school there were no dry eyes amongst all of my my daughter, all of her friends, a lot of my, and so I think that speaks volumes to the teachers and the connections the teachers make with the students during the school year. I mean, they were so sad to leave. And so, um, you know, just a huge thank you to the faculty and staff in the buildings because my kids just were, they, you know, I think, I don't want to say they didn't want summer to start, but they were so just adorably sad to leave their teachers. So it was good. Okay, all right then, uh, at this point we have our first opportunity for public comment. Uh, I don't see any public in the audience, but if anybody else had an opportunity to uh, say something. Seeing none, we can move on to our reports. I don't see any student council members here, so uh, does anybody have liaison reports? Two quick ones. Oh, go ahead, you go first. I have a quickie okay. um, from the Youth Commission. They met last week. Um, it wasn't a large gathering because there were several conflicting events that night, including the center school reuse forum. 
Um, but they talked about the difficulty in advertising their events, um, trying to get word around to all of the appropriate pockets in town. So just wanted to throw that out there. If you see word of their events, to pass it along your chain. That's good. My, well, thank you for saying the, the public forum for Center School Reuse, because that was part of my quick liaison yeah, report. Um, <clears throat> big meeting here. And I think it was well attended. And folks, I think that the speakers, including um, Dr. Kavanaugh, did a great job. And, and it seemed like it was, it, to me, seemed well received by the public. So hopefully the Center School Reuse team is sort of on the right path. And I feel like, you know, hopefully soon, within the next several months, we'll be able to make recommendations to the selectmen. So things are happening for the former Center School, well, Center School. Um, and then I also have um, the elementary school building committee. We met on Monday, and um, the school has been turned over to the schools, right? So it is now a school. Um, so uh, just quickly, things have been, folks are being trained on all the new systems, things are being moved in, there's tons of moving happening today um, and over the next several days. Um, and one of the things that was mentioned, and I know an, um, uh, an email went out, but because there's so many trucks moving in and out and um, so many folks, movers moving in and out, we really want to discourage the use of any of the facilities at this point because, um, I, you know, it just, we, don't, we want everybody to stay safe, basically. So I know your, your email went, said it much more eloquently than I ever would, but just came up in the meeting, so I thought I would bring it up. Um, and then um, there's a few little changes that are going on, including the fence that's going around the, uh, the pre-K um, playground, and some security features are being added to the school. But otherwise, it is so awesome. It is so awesome. I have to say that to the woman sitting across from us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That's all I got. Yeah, for me, not so many meetings as behind the scenes work. You'll, you'll see um, some updates that we are requesting for the website, the school website, specifically the school committee uh, menu. But overall, on the website front, too, Ashok is continuing to do some work there, and hopefully, we'll have some of those updates coming up. Um, also, on the calendar front, uh, the community calendar, we haven't gone live yet. I was to catch up uh, with. Uh, Jim Cousins, but uh, I had an emergency and I couldn't meet up with him. But hopefully by next week we should have that going. Okay. Uh, but we've certainly made that a priority uh, to get that going. And the other part is handing off of the meeting minutes to Jen. What I was hoping is to um, document the processes around it as to you know what are the kinds of minutes we do besides the regular meeting, which is more an oversight, but also the executive minutes, what's the process around it. So having that documented hopefully can be part of the packet that we were talking about, uh, an orientation packet of sorts or the procedures that we follow for new school committee members. So that could be institutionalized was the hope. Perfect. So that's underway. So hopefully next meeting uh, we can just do a quick review. I will need it. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Thank you. So I had my uh, meeting with HOP, which is Hopkinton Organized for Prevention. Uh, and how I guess it was last week. Uh, and they, were, the Board of Health was there talking about how the diversion program that they were able to, to work with the high school around vaping and jeweling, which we have seen to be a problem not just in Hopkinton but across high schools across the country uh, that the, they have a diversion program that they've been working with and they have seen that it the incidence of kids who have been through that diversion program are less likely those kids to be reoffending so that is positive hope going forward so that was that's all I have for liaisons uh, I, I think we'll take out of order the, and move on to the end of year reports, if that's okay with you. For just be, it's go And go back to the technology report when Mr. Ghosh is here. Certainly. Because we're ahead a little bit. So I will go through these numbers, but if there are people at home who are watching and you are interested in some of the end of year reports that come to us from the high school guidance department, I would encourage you to log into the website and just take a look at some of this data because it's amazing what's happening at our high school. Um, so I will just read through some of these very quickly. 95% uh, of the students graduating in the class of 2018 
so that's 273 of our students, and there were 288 of them, are going on to four-year colleges. Four students will be going on to two-year colleges. Uh, two percent, or six students, are planning to do a gap year. Two, per two students are going on to full-time employment, and three students are going to um, continue their education in other ways. So as we take a look at our SAT scores, and the SAT um, has in fact changed, um, our um, evidence-based reading and writing score, the average is 640, and the math average is 650. Eighty-six percent of our kids took the SAT in the class of 2018, even though we are in a time when fewer and fewer students seem to be t taking the SAT or fewer of them are taking it uh, multiple times, simply because fewer colleges are asking for an SAT score. Um, the ACTs, our average score was 27.6. The best score that you can get is a 36. 59% of the kids took that test, and when you get to somewhere around that 27.6 mark, you are in about the 85th percentile. So that's a very good statistic also for um, the class of 2018. 44% uh, of the graduates in the class of 2018 are enrolling in public colleges next year, and 16.6% .6 of those will be Massachusetts public colleges. If you log into our website, you will be able to see the matriculation report, and so you can see all of the colleges that kids in the class of 2018 will be attending. And you can also take a look at the colleges to which our kids applied. And I think that that data is very interesting. So for example, the lead college was the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, 134, 134 of our students applied there. And that will take you all the way down to the colleges that only a single student applied to. Um, the last information uh, that I will give to you are the um, SAT subject tests. Uh, kids took a SAT subject tests in biology, chemistry, Chinese, English literature, French, uh, Japanese, math, physics, Spanish, U.S. and world history. Um, and if you go onto the website, you'll be able to see other data around um, ACT scores. Uh, kids took ACT tests in uh, ELA, English, Math, Reading, Science, STEM, and Writing. So there are other um, statistics out there if folks are interested in them. But some very impressive college acceptances and some very impressive test scores, as always. All right, and we are ready to, ready to roll in. We're ahead of schedule a little bit, but are you ready to roll into the technology, or do you want us to? I think I am, yeah. Okay. I don't know if you, I'm not sure how to connect my screen. I don't know if we need to do that. I can just kind of talk about it if you want. It's up to you, but I am ready. I lack the technological savviness to help you with that. Yeah, so I can, <laughs> I can just talk about the updates and share the slides with you. It's not, it's not overly complex. Okay. If you want, you can email your presentation to to Bob, and maybe he can pull it up, and I could do just the acting superintendent's report that's super quick. Yeah. You have an HDMI connection? I do, yeah. Yeah, we can connect it if you want to do that up first. Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so. Do you want to do the acting superintendent? Surely, work to connect? because it's going to be super quick. All right. So the end of the year activities. Um, we celebrated our last flag day at Center School. And it was certainly an emotional day, a lovely day. We had our veterans with us, and we had some amazing first grade um, presentations and um, some kindergarten singers as well. So um, kudos to all of the classes who did poetry readings and sang different songs. Um, all of the presentations were fabulous. Um, over at the Elmwood School, we had a multicultural night, and that too was well attended and by all accounts, a lovely evening. Uh, we had eighth grade promotion. Is that two nights ago? Last it night? It feels like it was a just two last nights ago. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday night. Tuesday. Okay. I can't even keep the day straight anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think we had 286 students leaving the middle school to um, go off to uh, Hopkinton High School, among other um, high schools. And that was very nicely done by Mr. Keller, Ms. Ben Benick, and Ms. Lake. And so kudos to them for that. Uh, we have begun our move from center to marathon, and so, as we mentioned with the um, playgrounds, lots and lots of 
furniture and books and materials and technology is arriving at Marathon School hourly. Uh, we were there today having a meeting and things are just moving right along. So it's really exciting what's, what's happening there. And then finally, I do also want to say that we had a wonderful end to our school year this year. I think things went very smoothly. Um, doors closed pretty seamlessly. Kids left us very happily, I think. And so that doesn't happen by accident. It only happens when our teachers and our administrators and paraprofessionals and all of the folks who work in our buildings work together to make that happen. And, and it's, it's wonderful. And so they work very hard. And I feel like we should just give them a little applause there. So, so thank you to all of you. I think we are ready for Mr. Gush. Thank you. All right. So I think I was tasked to try to give an update to the school committee about uh, primarily the one-to-one -one programs, uh, I think specifically at the high school, uh, just to kind of give uh, new folks a chance to kind of answer questions about the programs, um, and then also answer any questions that might be coming up uh, in regards to the Apple bid or the uh, Chromebook bids that will be coming up in the near future. So. Um, just to kind of get started, you know, at the high school, um, the one-to-one -one laptop program, I think, is entering its seventh year uh, this year, so it's, time has flown quickly. Uh, and there's basically three ways to participate in the program at the high school. Uh, you can do a lease-to-own uh, through the district, um, which is uh, one way. Uh, bring your own device, um, or you can loan uh, a MacBook from the school. Uh, so if you do decide to do a lease program, that uh, usually involves four payments over uh, four years. Um, and students can pay or parents can pay via check or online. Um, the lease covers accidental damage, uh, covers warranty, um, and even theft at this point. So that's something new we added to the program last year. We typically had average um, Apple Care coverage, which was for four years, but just covered parts. Uh, it wasn't really cover covering accidental damage. So last year we worked with an outside vendor um, to provide extra coverage, which was really helpful for parents. Uh, so that covers any kind of damage, liquid damage to the machine, uh, and even theft. So that uh, started last year, and we'll be adding that again um, to the program this year. Uh, in addition to that, if you do do the lease program, the school provides management software, uh, certain software like Adobe, Creative Cloud, and some basic math software. So that's, that's option one. Uh, the second option is the Bring Your Own Device, or the BYOD program, uh, where students can bring a laptop or a device from home. Uh, it doesn't have to be a laptop. Some students have started to bring an iPad or a Chromebook. Uh, the numbers are still relatively small in terms of the number of kids bringing those types of devices, but we are seeing more and more of those devices. And since most of the curriculum is kind of web-based, it doesn't rely on a ton of uh, local software, so that hasn't been a problem. Um, so it is any type of device, but most kids end up bringing uh, a laptop from home. Uh, those, those students have the same access to the same software, so we have a you know, building license for Adobe, Adobe, so we can also give that license to someone that's bringing their own device. So the students that are bringing their own device aren't really put at a disadvantage from, from a software point of view. Uh, and the same with the math program. So we buy enough individual licenses to cover uh, anyone bringing their own device as well. Um, we will support students um, in the tech center in terms of troubleshooting with those types of devices. We're just not legally allowed to break open those devices and fix them. So there's no in-house repairs for um, students that are on the BYD program, but we do help them with internet connectivity issues or any account issues that they have. Uh, so we do as much as we can to help those students as well. Um, we just can't repair them. So just to give you some numbers, because a lot of people ask, well, how many people are participating in what ways? Uh, this year, the current incoming ninth graders, we have so far 187 students are going to lease. Uh, 11 will be student use, and then about 62 are BYOD. And then there's about 15 we haven't heard from. And typically, the 15 we're starting to hear from are usually just not returning or going, or going to a different school uh, in the fall. So we have made contact with those, with those folks. And then currently this year um, and starting last year, we offered two models. So there's two different models. Students can choose from a MacBook Air 13-inch um, computer or a MacBook Pro. And we started bringing that back in last year because we had some concerns that the MacBook Air model might um, disappear over time because Apple hadn't really spent a lot of time to refresh that product in terms of hardware. 
Uh, but they still, they did do some hardware refresh to it this year and still on the market. So we're still giving that option to parents because some parents and students want a little higher end model. So we are offering that. It's a little more work on our part, but we'll continue to do that until we see what's happening with Apple and whether they decide to get rid of the air. So um, that is going on as well. The, the last option is uh, a student use option. So students are issued a MacBook Air during orientation. At the same time, uh, other kids get their laptops. Uh, we still provide support for that device. Uh, that device needs repairs. We'll repair it in-house like the other least students. Uh, that device has the same type of web filtering on it that goes home and is filtering the device in school. So that's pretty handy for parents and for students. Um, on top of that, students do return the laptop at the end of the school year, so most of the school, student use devices are collected uh, just this time of year. Uh, we do make exceptions for kids that are, uh, you know, need a device at home. So if someone, you know, uh, through a request and say, I'm taking a class over the summer, I don't have technology at home, can I, can I take this device and use it for the class I'm taking this summer? Or I'm writing a college essay, I don't have a device at home, can I use this? And so we'll make exception for those kids. They just have to let us know that, what the purpose is of the device. Other than that, it's our time to take them back and repair them and clean them up and get them ready uh, for the next year. And we do try to give those students coming back the following year the same device. So they don't have to worry about losing anything that they've saved locally on that machine. Uh, then at the end of the, the four years, they return that device back. We try to recycle them and use them for the incoming ninth graders. Um, but they're not usually allowed to uh, buy those devices. Some, some parents have asked that lately. Can we buy out these devices? They're old, but we, we typically can't. There are some years when they get really old, well, where we might have that option, but that's not a yearly, a yearly thing where we're actually able to sell uh, those types of devices. So that's the last type. Any questions before I go on in terms of the types of devices or the types of options that students have when they participate? I had a question. I don't remember the um, student, the 11 student devices. Is that a newer part of this program? Or is that uh, student, I just, the, 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 lo the loaning? The program? loaner for, that they're allowed to. I didn't remember that they could take them home. Yeah, the, the loaning device has been there since the okay. beginning. In the first year of the program, we were, we were trying to figure out what was going to work. And right. The first year, we were trying to think, well, the device should stay at home. I was sorry, I should stay at school. Right. And that just wasn't necessarily fair to those kids that needed a device at home. Uh, and it was just a management issue in general, like right. collecting them every day, trying to track those kids down. So um, we basically allowed those parents to sign a take home uh, contract that just says they'll be responsible for taking care of that device when it goes home. Uh, and we allowed those students to take, take the device home. That's, so that's, that's great. That's been going on for the last you know, several years. Um, and that, so that's been one of the changes since we first started the program. Uh, and the other minor change, which was something to do with the free and reduced lunch of the financial aid piece, when we first started it, um, we were looking at ways to try to provide financial aid to the kids um, for purchase, uh, and it just it wasn't really working out. So we had no way to really do that. So if parents do qualify for financial aid or on free or reduced lunch, that does not mean they can actually get uh, a laptop to purchase at a discounted rate. So sometimes parents misunderstand that now, but we've tried to kind of communicate that out that um, they have to buy it at the regular rate the other kids do um, if they're on financial aid. So but they no would be able to take a loaner but for the year. Correct. So yeah. they still have that option. And parents that still maybe are struggling financially, we, we still work with them to try to make up payments. Mm -hmm. You know, So if someone says ahead of time, I really want a device for, for my student, but can I break this payment up over three months? Uh, we try to we try to accommodate those parents and, and work with them to make that happen. So, um, right. other questions? How much is the annual fee? The annual fee, uh, there's a slide coming up uh, here we can talk about. It depends on the model. Uh, so basically, these pricing are based on uh, last year's models uh, and what we, we did when we went out to bid. So one side is uh, model one, which is the MacBook Air on the, on the left which is $1,027, and then the Pro on the other side is uh, $1,695. So we break those up over four years, and then the upfront payment is more because that includes the, I think, $100 and I think it's $83 is built in that first payment that covers the warranty. So we have to pay that company upfront for the coverage, so the, the, the first payment's a little higher. Um, and then typically, the, the last couple payments are lower. 
Um, and then people are going to look and they'll see the payment reminders or they'll look on the website and they'll say the prices are all over the place. Well, they are. They vary. For example, if some of the prices last year were much lower than we typically get because Apple did make a mistake on the bid and honored that, honored that price to us in the end. So if you're comparing even these numbers to what most people were paying for the air, it's quite different. So people right now are lucky in the ninth grade. They're, I think their payments are $34 and 75 cents for the next three years. So those parents got lucky. $34 um, total. What's that? $34 total. So they, they had to pay $34 for the next three payments. Uh, so they paid the 533 up front and three payments at $34. Uh, so Apple obviously is not was not happy about that mistake, but honored it. Um, so we won't see that. So I guess my point is just when you look from year to year, there's a couple factors that will determine price. Our, obviously our volume. Mm -hmm. the number of kids we have, you know, the breakdown between MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs, uh, and then what Apple decides to, to offer us in, in a bit. Uh, so the, the numbers will vary, uh, but the other numbers pretty much stay the same. Uh, the only other fee that we really charge in there is, in terms of fees is $6. We usually charge for a management fee, which helps cover the, the software license to help manage the devices um, at home. Um, so that, that is built into the actual cost. Other than that, it's just the cost of the device uh, and the cost of the warranty uh, that's in this cost. I have a few questions. Sure. Uh, one, what's the typical uh, life of these laptops? Um, these laptops can last at least six years or longer. It depends on the care of, and the, how well the students uh, care for them. Uh, we definitely see a large number of students making the decision to take them to school. Um, and so I think Four years is definitely a, a good, solid life for them. You know, at that point, you might need to put some work into it. You might need to replace a battery um, on the device at that point, but typically uh, it would continue to run. You know, I think beyond six years, you'll start to see that it's maybe slower, and as the operating systems get more advanced, they're not as, as quick, and so over time, they'll, they'll fade out, you know, just because the software is getting more complex, not necessarily because the hardware doesn't work anymore. So I would say six years is definitely pretty typical for these devices. Um, and if you're not taking care of them, then four is, okay. four is a struggle for some. <laughs> um, and in terms of antivirus software and mm -hmm. what have you, how is that covered? Uh, the district pays for uh, a license, uh, a district-wide li license of Sophos. We get through a, a collaborative buy um, through, X I think it's the Accept Collaborative. Uh, so that license covers all of our um, devices, but also covers the student devices as well. Excellent. And even the students that are uh, on the BYOD program can download and install that software. That's great. That's great. Um, do you maintain any kind of statistics on the services that are provided, the servicing that is done by the technology team? Uh, we maintain tickets, uh, a ticketing system um, to, to kind of help track the repairs we do, and then we actually any physical repair we do um, to the device, we have to report because we're we're an Apple certified shop. So we do the repairs in house uh, for these machines. So anytime we order a part, that's all tracked. Um, so yeah, do you do you need specific numbers in terms of the number of repairs there? the techs are actually doing or? Right now, I'm just curious to know that if you track any of that and use that in any kind of negotiations going back with uh, the providers of the laptops. Um, no, we haven't done that. We've just used that data to kind of improve our in-house response time. So we look at that and say, all right, an average you know, technician repairs so many tickets or completes so many tickets in so many days. Mm -hmm. And we use that internally in our department to kind of manage our workflow and to get better. Uh, we definitely don't use that with Apple because it, it's probably not going to get us very far, but um, we would, we'd be willing to try. <laughs> um, you know, that's the one thing. Apple's got great hardware, but, you know, they're the, they're the big brother on the block, and, you know, a lot of times they're in charge, so we do our best to try to get pricing, but I'm not sure if that would necessarily help, but I'm willing to try. <laughs> just, just curious to know how yeah. the statistics are dragged and used. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have a question that comes up from year to year, and I, I like when you answer it because I think you do it more eloquently than I do. But why is it that we do Apple devices as opposed to other? Um, um, well, brands? I think when we first looked at the program, you know, there was a lot of debate in the town between you know Apple devices, Windows devices, and Apple versus Chrome or Apple versus iPad. So that was, right. and actually at that time there wasn't really a Chromebook option even in the picture. Um, so. 
I think the, the, the biggest thing we look at is really the combination of hardware and software and how well they work together. Um, and the second area is just they're not as prone to infection uh, with malware. Uh, it's not that they're not uh, you know, able to be infected, they are, but they're just not in business as much as um, PCs are. So PCs just as a group are, are, are targeted more than, than Macs. Um, so we definitely don't feel that we are fixing them a lot in terms of malware issues uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's one issue. Um, the other issue is they're easy to use. Um, the other things we looked at are just time and professional development for teachers. And so teachers have had these devices in their hands for a, a number of years before we even went to the, the one one program. And so they have a stronger comfort level in the classroom with these devices and are able to help students. Uh, with these devices, um, and then minor things are we, we can be a service shop, so we can be an Apple certified shop that we can re repair things in house and save some money on repairs for students. Yeah. Uh, we can turn them around quicker, so turnaround time is faster. Um, so those are some other things that we've looked at to kind of help um, stick with Apple for now. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Since we have Mr. Bush, one more question. Sure. Um, so how do you um, check with kids, the students, what their experience is and, uh, you know, how is that going, their usage and their preference and whatnot? Do you track any of that? Do you question them? Do you have a sense of it? The preference, I missed the first part, sorry, the preference for the for use of the device? That's right. Um, we did, a, you know, an evaluation, a big evaluation in year one to kind of get feedback from both the students, parents, uh, and faculty. Uh, so I can kind of share that data with you. Um, in the last several years, um, we haven't really put out any survey data to, to collect from students or parents uh, to figure out if, if they're, they're satisfied with the program or we're happy to do that. Um, I think we've just been kind of tied up with implementing the one-to-one -one at the middle school and getting just devices in there that we we haven't done that in a while, so we're, we're happy to revisit that and get you that data. Um, but other than that, it's really just word of mouth talking to parents. I mean, I spend a lot of time <laughs> talking with parents, working, you know, obviously collecting payments over four classes is, involves quite a bit of communication with parents. And so, uh, or just seeing parents in town saying, you know, that's a great program, this has really helped. Or parents saying, like, I'm glad you were able to, you know, split up a payment for me. I was able to buy a device. And, and, in other situations, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So just local feedback from parents and talking to some folks, it seems like they've been pretty happy with it. But I'm definitely open to doing a more formal survey. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and I, I don't know if there's, I think I've covered most things. We talked about cost. Actually, if you don't mind going back to the cost, I can sure. see the slide very clearly. OK. Um, the numbers were not very clear. Yeah, so I can I can send it and share it with you. I'm not quite able to zoom in on this view. Let me see. It's getting smaller. Does that help at all? Yeah, that does help a little. Yeah, so yes. basically on the left, I mean, the monthly payments are $147 uh, a month for the, the MacBook Air and $358 uh, for the Pro. Uh, and this is based on last year's model. Um, and then this year, so we, we, we coordinate and tell parents ahead of time that this is what we expect and we don't expect it to be more than this. And then when the bid comes in and is awarded, we look at the numbers and then redo the math and say this is going to be your actual cost. Uh, and we do anticipate the cost coming down a little bit. Definitely the, the cost has already dropped on Apple's website for the MacBook Pro, so we know that that's going to be, that's going to be cheaper. So we'll see what the bid is when it comes in, but I think you're looking at the cost, the actual cost of the MacBook Air being probably around $750 uh, without insurance and things like that. So, so it's, it's definitely a, a better deal to kind of go through the school, because a lot of parents ask and they want to wait and say, okay, let me know when the bid comes in, <laughs> actually. So there are people waiting for phone calls and say, like, what, what's the actual cost going to be? And we're making a decision about whether to go out and buy a device. And so some people wait on the numbers and then we'll call them back and say, these are the actual numbers. But when they look at that and they look at the service that we provide, not having to wait at the Apple store <laughs> for a repair, <laughs> yeah. the, the decision with the cost becomes pretty easy for a lot of parents. Uh, just the, not having the headache of dealing with a device and the repair of a device is, is pretty advantageous. 
Um, I think cover. These are kind of the ratios and some other things about the other programs. But I think just in comparing this to the one to one, obviously at the middle school, it's different in the fact that the one to one at the middle school is a is a Chromebook device provided by the school district, um, and those devices are leased uh, on a three year lease cycle. So this year the lease is is expired, and we're shipping and getting ready to pack away roughly 1,200 uh, Chromebooks back to the, uh, the financer. Uh, and then we'll be uh, closing on a bid hopefully soon uh, with uh, new Chromebooks coming in, hopefully to be here uh, by the end of August. Uh, and those are obviously devices that go home with the students. Um, I think we're gonna work with students to try to take a little better care of the devices. I mean, middle school is a little tougher crowd. Uh, it does require some, some, some reminders and some trainings. Those will come with accidental coverage. Uh, there is a limited coverage policy on those, so it really only covers repairs on, on three times, I think. So so I think that's enough to try to get the kids through. I think at that point, if they've damaged it more than three times, we'll, we'll probably go to the parents and ask them to help cover the cost of the repair, unfortunately. But that will happen in some cases, um, but that's how we plan on rolling it out um, this year. So, so we'll try that and see how it goes. Um, and that I don't, I think that's mostly it. This is just kind of some equipment goals and some other things that we've had uh, that we're kind of meeting. So this is just what we were trying to get through as far as our technology um, plan uh, was to try to get one to one in, in high school, middle school, and now at Hopkins, and then two to one ratios at Elmwood and Marathon. And once the new devices come in at Marathon, we'll, we'll pretty much be at our at our goal. Um, and everything's on cycles, lease cycles, or purchase cycles. Uh, and we can kind of focus on some other things. So I'm happy to answer any questions on this. Uh, this is really uh, the staff leases. Just talking a little bit about the staff leases. All the staff are on different lease cycles, and they're on uh, different four-year windows. So this happens to be a year that we're not renewing any of the teacher machines. Uh, so we get a little, little bit of a break. Uh, whereas you see in year four, the middle school will be the next refresh uh, next year for those machines so that's what those numbers mean so the high school ones are the ones where we are um, charging or asking for a fee correct correct yep whereas um, anything whether it's middle school or hopkins where it's one-to-one -one, and middle school is where the kids are able to take the devices home correct there we are not um and hopkins are not yet you know i think okay. uh there hasn't been a decision or discussion yet about that i think it's possible you might see in the future maybe the fifth grade having some pilots looking at whether those kids need a device or making it optional for some kids to bring a device home because more and more of the curriculum is becoming digital and so if that is the case and a kid doesn't have a um, device at home um, we want to make sure they have access to the curriculum so if that ever happens we would probably look at you know providing that opportunity for uh, the fifth graders but for now it's a cart based model uh, there's a cart per classroom. They stay in those carts during the day and charge, and then are used as as needed. So, yeah, I'm very interested in in knowing how um, you know the usage part of it. You know, how is it tied to the curriculum, especially as we come to the lower grades, mm -hmm. right? So, they using the devices. What all are the programs that they're using? How is it tied to the district goals with regard to the curriculum? If there is any way that can be shared. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to do another follow-up date if that, that helps you um, uh, before the budget season goes. And we can talk a little bit more specifically about, about the curriculum and, right. and what's happening in the classroom, right. uh, because that would take a little bit of time. Oh, I, mean, sure. I, I could get into that now, but it, I don't want to derail your agenda for tonight, right. but I, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. That's the fun stuff. I mean, that's really why why we, we do that, you know, spend the, the hours getting all this stuff ready and so right. so we can see it happen and unfold in the classroom. So I'm happy to share that with you. That'll be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that's pretty much this, what I had to cover. And I know, I know there's maybe some further website discussions that maybe is later in the night. And so I'm happy to answer any of those particulars later on. We're good. This is great. A lot of work. Yeah, it's busy. Yeah. Roughly 5,000 devices. 
in the in the schools that are <laughs> needing to be managed. And I'm guessing summer is not a quieter time for the technology department. Uh, it's not. I'm probably a little dirty from moving stuff from <laughs> center school to the marathon today, but uh, it's going well. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that brings us into the acting superintendent's report. Did you? Did we did that. So we that did. actually brings yeah. us into the school committee chair report. So I'm going to talk about the warrants a little bit, but I just wanted to, uh, before we go into the specifics of the warrants, to explain to people, because it is a little bit, I think for people that are out there watching, we talk about the warrants by number, not specifically what it is. Mm -hmm. And the warrants can be found, they're not, are they in our public packet? They're not in our no, but, so, so, but they no. are, they are the bills that the district incurs. It used to be that we would have three school committee members sign them at the school committee member after we had voted on them. And last year when Susan started, it was pointed out, it, it probably could repeat yourself more eloquently than I, but I, I think what you had said is that it, it holds up some of the payment of the bills by having them come to the school committee first because they can't pay the bill until it's been authorized. So what we voted on last year was to have the chair go in and sign and look at the actual warrants and what's been spent and then bring them back here to for the five of us to look at and review. And I think that because the bills have actually been paid at this point, we can discuss kind of moving forward if we have concerns about the bills because they are in the packet that we have on the Google Drive. So anyway, so in, in that vein, I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants number 18-081, 18-082, 18-083, all warrants have been included uh, in the packet. And then I have approved for payment the payroll warrant number S18025 and S1825A. And all of those should also be included in the, it's actually in the Google Drive. I don't know if anybody had any commentary or questions about that, because I do think it's important to have a transparent way that we're doing it so that people understand how the bills are being paid and that we're in discussing it, we are signing off on the fact that the district is paying the bills, which is important for lights and staff mm -hmm. being paid. Right. I would just like to um, thank you for explaining the process, because I think that is helpful for people. And I think if you look at our policy as it's written currently, it reflects the old process. So um, if you're new, like, say, Meg and myself, right. you might read the policy, and, and it might not match what you see here. So I would right. definitely welcome a conversation to see how to um, bring those two in alignment, the actual uh, practice, and then what the policy says. I agree. I think that was an oversight after we had discussed it last year. So I would look to the policy folks among us to look at that and bring it into alignment with both what our practice is and what we want to see as a school committee. So there's, there's that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you for the okay. adult revolving account consolidation. Thank you. So basically what this is, this is a revolving account that exists that used to have activity within it, but the programs that were run through that um, no longer exist. We no longer run driver's education as, as a, for instance, which was um, probably last run in 2014. So this account basically is just sitting there. Um, we have run one program through it, but it really is a building use program, if you will. Um, so it just makes sense to consolidate this uh, account into our building use um, revolving account. And then again, the building use revolving is used to pay for electricity, um, contracted services for um, the buildings, so. So basically this, <coughs> this 29,000, I took my glasses off, that <laughs> roughly, has just kind of been sitting dormant for several years Correct. and so if we transfer it we can use it to pay to pay bills to yes. pay warrants for example mm -hmm. yes. all right so i mean yeah that makes good sense okay any other discussion or questions and can i just ask so will it have any future connection with adult education even if it is the building use revolving fund now so currently we don't run any adult education programs but if we were it would be structured similar to anything else, any other program that's coming in to use the building. They would be subject to the building use fees, custodial fees, so the program basically would fit within the confines of what the um, building use revolving account is used for. 
So if we developed an 18 to 22 program, mm -hmm. this funds, these I funds. I would think that has its own separate. Yeah. Am I right? The 18 to 22 program would have its own separate. Currently, that is housed in the high school, you know, during the regular school day. Um, right. One of the things that we had talked about with the elementary school, with the center school reuse uh, group, was thinking about moving an 18 yeah. to 22 into center school. It would be great. It would be lovely. Yeah. We need that. We also need a transition specialist in the high school. Mm. More than five hours a month. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it out there. All right, then. All right. If there are other comments, I don't want to skip over anybody else's questions over this. No. Okay. Then I would request um, an, a motion to approve the consolidation of the Adult Education Revolving Fund account in the amount of $29,483.87 into the Building Use Revolving Fund. So moved. Second. So motion by... Ms. Devlin and a second by Ms. Tyler. All those in favor? Yes. And yes, so it is unanimous. And then we are moving into the field hockey overnight field trip. Okay, so uh, I am presenting this information on behalf of Dee King, athletic director. Um, this would be the 11th year that the girls' field hockey teams would be going to Dennis Yarmouth to play in this tournament. Um, they leave on September 7th, which is a Friday afternoon after the regular school day. They will return on September 8th um, after their entire play day. It's uh, pretty much a sort of recreational kind of experience. I think that games start every 30 minutes. They play for about 22 minutes. It's an opportunity for refs to kind of you know, re-up their licensure. So um, all in all, it's, it's a very good experience. And um, because it is an overnight trip, you as a school committee need to approve that. I love it. Okay. I just, I just want to, uh, okay. go ahead. Um, I had had two um, comments and I want to thank you for the information. Um, one question I had was, will there be um, AEDs available on the fields? Because the paperwork indicated that there was no guarantee of a trainer. Yes. And um, Ms. King was um, quick to respond that there's a new law that requires AEDs on the field when there's no trainer. And we budgeted for that and it was approved. So in fact, they will be bringing those along. So I was happy to hear that because uh, preseason, especially, you can never tell when you might need something. So um, the other question I had was about financial assistance, because this is sort of a one-off. It's not exactly part of the curriculum. Um, and I just wanted to find out if there was a process or is there a way, uh, something indicated on the sign-up form that indicates that if financial assistance is needed, um, whom to contact and make sure that's a discrete process, because I'm sure as a team they all want to go but I want to make sure that there's um, a process available for them to get help if needed. And did Ms. King respond to you on that? She did, indi uh, she did indicate that they were uh, sensitive to that. Yes. I'm not sure if it's on the form and how the parent knows about that. Okay, so I can find so, out if it's on that form yeah. or not on that form. Okay. Yeah. But I don't necessarily know that we have sort of ever denied a kid who you know, has those kinds of needs, but I will certainly find out whether or not it exists on the form. My only concern was that for new families, they might not think to, that it's available for something like this that's right. not exactly a school program. And Ms. King had said that this um, funding for financial assistance would come from the, the boosters, I think, or from the yes. fees that the team had raised. So it's a bit of a one-off. Right. Um, so is. that's the only reason why maybe more explicitly saying how to get access if needed would okay. be helpful. Could we, re we request that that point. information be included in whatever they're sending out to the, whether it's on the form or not, somehow be included in what they're sending to the families, that there's financial aid. Yeah, available. probably in the informational packet. Right, exactly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think, we I think it's right. covered, but just to make no, it clear. No, but it should have, but you're right. There yeah. are kids new to the high school and new to, it's, if it's not explicitly out there, it can be hard for parents to know that it's okay to ask. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so then I am, um, Seeking that you will vote to approve the Hopkinton field hockey team overnight trip September 7th and 8th to the Dennis Yarmouth High School. So moved. Second. Motion by Meg and second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. yes. And I'm a yes, so that.
carries unanimously. All right. And the next field trip that we have, again, I am uh, here standing in for Mr. Keller. Um, in this particular field trip, the kids are going to um, Nature's Classroom. I believe this is our 26th year attending Nature's Classroom. Um, I guess the lovely part of Nature's Classroom, I mean, we take kids and we put them in this environmentally uh, sort of based educational experience. They are away from school and they are staying in lodges and you can take a look in the packet at all of the different curricular options. Uh, but what Mr. Keller would, I think, tell you is the loveliest part of that trip is that kids get to sort of have that um, team building and relationship building. And what he has said is that some of the friendships that begin at Nature's Classroom are things that sort of last a lifetime. Uh, the day is broken up into you know, field group experiences, special interest classes, there are evening classes. And I think by all accounts, um, this has been successful for many, many years. And so they are seeking approval to um, have an overnight field trip from October 23rd to 26th, 2018, to Nature's Classroom, which is in Charlton, Massachusetts, about 45 minutes away. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I'm not, when this first came before us, it did come up, I think, that there is financial aid available for this trip as well. Yes. And um, are students with disabilities provided with aids during this time? I would imagine that if a student in his or her IEP has um, a one-to-one -one para, that this, because this is an extension of the school day, that that one-to-one -one para okay. um, continues throughout the trip. I would imagine that it's just part and parcel of the IEP. So a 24-hour para. Well, the teachers are also 24 hours. So if you are a faculty member who decides that you are willing to chaperone this, you are there 24 hours. And I think Mr. Ghosh can talk a little bit about having been on that trip before when it has done nothing but pelt rain for three days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. <laughs> so. <laughs> Nancy, on the financial aid, I had asked a question about that as well. Mr. Keller said that is because it's sort of typical within the curriculum, it goes through the central office and follows our procedures for um, financial assistance. Yes. Yeah, he did link the policy yes. to his yes. response. Yes. That's great. Okay. Well, then I guess if there, if there are no other questions, we're looking for a motion to approve the Hopkinton Middle School grade six overnight field trip October 23rd to 26th to Nature's Classroom. So moved. Amanda? Second. And Meg. All right. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. Unanimous and so carries. That moves us on to the paraprofessional request from Mrs. Rabo. Hello. Good evening. Um, <laughs> so the request before you is to support student needs who were not known to us when developing the FY19 budget. Um, in our budgeting process, we plan for our staffing based on our preschoolers transitioning to kindergarten, kindergartners transitioning to first grade, and these students were not students who had, um, who were before us and or their needs were not before us at their time, at the time. So when we look at how can we support students that per their IEPs have these required, we need to provide these services and support and we don't have the flexibility with the current special education um, paraprofessional staffing that we have. So for one example, I can take you through the process when a student comes to us um, and they demonstrate some challenges. We have something called the LST. It's a learning support team. You can bring children to that. We have it in all our, our um, schools. And you work collaboratively on approaches to address students' needs, whether it's academically, social emotionally, behaviorally. You develop an action plan. And parents are informed of this th throughout um, the process. And you, is that effective? Is that working? You know, you revisit your instructional plan, if you will, or behavioral plan, whatever that child needs to determine. And many times, that, that is what the child needs. We have success, and we're able to provide children support through the general education um, process. So in, in one particular case, it did um, not meet that child's needs. We did then have uh, an eligibility meeting for special education services, and that child does require services, which as we move through the process using data to guide that process, that was after the budget, um, which we start in the fall and, and um, you know, late winter. 
in our other um, need, we have a student who is choosing Hockington and their family, um, wonderful district. So they are moving um, to us from another town within the state. And we've done our due diligence. Are you, are you really coming? Because sometimes it's just a perspective scout, if you will. Mm -hmm. They are coming. And once we determined that, our team chair participated in a transition meeting. And this is a child that has substantial needs. Um, our goal would be to add integration to this child's services to let you know that's, that's pretty significant. Um, at this time, the child does not have any time with peers. And as we work with our integrating all students and throughout the district, that's something that we will look to do when that child is with us um, at Marathon next year. So these are children who weren't, and their needs weren't known to us at that time of budgeting. So I know it's terrible to be here mere days after school, but um, we welcome children, all children, every day of the year. <laughs> and they don't always come right before the budget process. <laughs> so, and that, um, and that is why I'm here tonight. And I think just to clarify, we will be able to fund these two positions out of the regular operating budget. Any questions, comments? Are these full-time positions? They would be, yeah. yes. In our prior professional contract, we have three delineations, if you will. Um, the A classification, classification is a general education paraprofessional. A B classification is a special education paraprofessional. A C uh, level is the ABA paraprofessional. We were able to do some adjustments so that we could have um, the level of need supported for one student, but now we need to have two B needs, if you will. Okay. So it is a, a special education paraprofessional. What has helped us there is as we have worked on building up independence and in, in strengthening student skills, again, both socially and academically, we have been able to transition some students from a more intensive programming, which they need an alternative programming, to moderate, which is more um, support accessing the curriculum. So that's a wonderful thing to have. Um, that's our goal throughout the district, and to be, even have some children transitioning so it means moving from most restrictive to least restrictive. So mm -hmm. sometimes you, you can't tell who is the child that has needs in the classroom. And to me, that's a beautiful, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. I think you all do a wonderful job of integrating these kids. And I think it not only benefits the kids with disabilities, but everyone it in the It benefits classroom. all. It's uh, wonderful. And children have strengths in mm -hmm. a variety of areas. So you can have a child who might academically be very challenged, but through their creative um, art processes or just their ability to create something in the block center, they are the star um, and vice versa. So what's wonderful is sort of building that up in everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. So. If there are no more questions, then I would seek a motion to approve two additional paraprofessional positions at the Marathon Elementary School for the 2018 to 19 school year. So moved. Okay, Thank so you. good. Second. Meg with the motion, Amanda with the second. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It is unanimous and so moves. Uh, and the next item on our agenda here is future item future agenda items. So it's the agenda item about the agenda items. <laughs> so I'm just going to just for the sake of more our audience at home to talk a little bit. The agenda, the way it has always been developed in the past and the way, it, the way we've done it is that the superintendent and the school committee chair and the executive assistant to the superintendent sit and put the all the numbers in to make sure that it kind of follows along a timeline that is relatively close to what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. And the agenda items have flowed from school, the school committee members through the chair or through the superintendent. And looking at how some of the other boards do it, I noticed that there are some that also actually talk about future agenda items in the meeting. And I was thinking that might be a, a good opportunity for all of us to discuss together because we can do it publicly because it's posted yes. that we're going to do it. Uh, and to put those things on a list and to plug them in as appropriate for the future meetings. So Great. not to put everyone on the spot, mm -hmm. um, but th that's what this space is for. And if people have things on the top of their head that they know they want to bring forward, now would be a great time. Otherwise, it can be a placeholder for next time. So I, I'd love to mention a couple things, if that's OK. Sure. Um, I, I'd really 
like it if we could craft an ethics policy. We don't seem to have one in the district, and neighboring districts have one. It's a kind of standard policy, but I think it would be helpful for those of us joining the school committee so we know exactly what to do, not that I think we would make any egregious action so early in the process. Um, but I think clarity and, and being more explicit would be helpful. Um, I'd also like to discuss in the future the possibility of developing a diversity and racial equity subcommittee. Because even though Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned we were going to wait for the next strategic plan to dive into this, I think that there's a lot of preparatory work that we need to do, um, which could start taking place right now to try to find out numbers. How diverse is our staff? How diverse is our student body? Um, and I, I think Framingham Public School Committee has a really good model for this, which I'd be happy to investigate. Um, so that's something I'd like to discuss as a group, if we could. Okay, that's, that's great. The ethics policy, I think, should come back to the whole group, but I, I think maybe we'd start with the policy mm -hmm. to research, and I know that you had provided some links that might be helpful for yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. And MASC, I'm sure, has some good resources and interesting you talked you brought the diversity and racial equity I know that Nina had mentioned something yes. about that at the last time Dr. Kavanaugh uh, Dr. Kavanaugh I think I could say your name right <laughs> 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 and I had actually had been discussing something along the same lines last week yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, about how that would be a great to do some of that work up front before we get to the yeah, strategic it, plan so it that feels like it's necessary I, I think is a great thing to put yeah. put down going forward and can I make one more? You can. I mean, you opened the field, I, I Nancy. Did. No, I think there this is good. So I would, I would love it if we could discuss this reorganization moment after the new group were elected and come into play and then wham, bam, who's the chair, who's the vice chair? We need to have a discussion about what that means and, and what are the roles of the chair in this context right. as opposed to board of selectmen or something sure. else. But. You know, watching school committee from afar for years, there seems to be a lot going on that's not as outwardly clear as it could be. And I think the more explicit we are about our practice, I think the better for everybody. I agree. I think being explicit about our practice benefits everybody uh, and being as transparent as we possibly can. Be. Absolutely. Uh, I do think that will have some policy implications. I think we could also kind of mm -hmm. work in here and have a discussion and bring it back to policy at some point to make sure that our policy, as we do with all of our policies, try to make them match what our actual practice is. That's great. So. Thank you. I have a few. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is regretting uh, this already. So, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> no, first, this is I, I must applaud you. I think this is a fantastic move uh, on behalf of our new chair. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think it's a step to kind of keep it open as uh, everybody has been asking for. So great job, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, so one thing that I was hoping to talk about is communication in general. You know, where is the room for improvement? What, what is it that we have in place? in terms of communication and how can we make it better in multiple areas, if you will, uh, whether it be a teacher parent, whether it is the principal, the larger community, <coughs> the superintendent in the larger community, even our school website, which we'll talk about a little bit, which is our face to the to the whole world, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if we can talk a little bit about that and what is it that we could possibly as a school committee send out, where is the room for improvement, I, I think. Um, something around that would be very helpful. Um, the second thing that I would like us to talk about, which I've seen in our school improvement plan specifically, is around differentiation. Um, I would want to understand what is it that we have already in place with regard to differentiation uh, in instruction and learning and assessment that we have in place already, and um, what are some of the plans. So something around that line. Okay. It's so all good stuff. Yeah, it's all good stuff. And, and we can figure out where exactly we go with it. And I'm very excited about the diversity and racial equity subcommittee. I, I think that would be a fantastic thing to do. Um, I think that's yeah. all good ideas. We could do it all at once in America. Yeah, I know. Meeting, it, or we could yeah, you just open the flag. Break it. No, I, no, but I think this is good. Come. I think we'll keep 
<laughs> things going. I think that's the way the agenda is always supposed to be a, a, a group effort that we're all bringing it forward. But I think the ability to discuss it in an open forum where people can see, maybe it'll increase our viewership if they see well, issue, it, this, issues to be discussed in the future. This feels better to me because I've been terrified to send emails, afraid that I'm breaking the yeah. open meeting law. And after our school committee training, they really put the fear of the open <laughs> meeting law in my heart. So I feel like I can't speak to any of you unless we're sitting in this semicircle, yeah. far too brightly lit, mind you. Um, so I'd be grateful for a chance to kind of plan in advance. The third so. one would be around the um, orientation for the new school committee members. I know we have talked about it in the past. But something around that, those lines, I think that would be very helpful too. I think that would be great to pick back up where we were. And I think the advantage now is having new members. I'm sure you guys have found holes in what has been provided to you and to be able to maybe take notes. Oh, so many. So many. Uh, that's that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that will help going forward that what we're able to do and maybe also provide dialogue for what else you need that has not been given to you that could be more easily accessible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have one Excellent. potential feature. Um, first of all, I, I really like the ones that I've heard so far. They're sort of on my list um, as well, so thank you for bringing them up. Um, the only one that I, it's more parochial to what we do as a school committee and sort of how, I'm still at the how do we work and what do we do phase. Um, and I've been exploring a lot of other districts, um, school committees, and how what they do. And I'm wondering if we have an appetite for setting goals, operational goals for the school committee. For the year or globally? For the, for the year, I think. I think that's a um, fabulous idea. Things that will help, help bring our work into focus for the year and, and let people know. Um, of course, I, I think that they need to align with our values, our mission, and the district goals, and so forth. But within the school committee, what is it that we want to accomplish? Yeah that's sort of tangible and measurable in, in the course of this year. In addition to passing a budget. In addition to, and there are actually, yeah, there are a number of districts that do this, and I think it's- I think um, it's a great- It helps people know what we're working on and where our focus is, and helps um, make sure we're focused enough to, to deliver, in addition to the other things that we do. That's great. Super. I'm, I'm not going to do two more things. No, it's okay. I actually I wasn't entirely clear what That's future okay. agenda items. So was you can going save to, yours to the future. <laughs> so I'm just going to think about this and move on. Yeah. That's okay. But I did want to come back to because, Meg, you mentioned the open meeting law, and just I am aware that there is a meeting going on, I think, next week that in the community of the advanced learners group and I didn't I wanted to make sure that if there were more than two school committee members planning on attending that that we could have that posted um, as a public not to put people on the spot but perhaps um, if people know they're going and if there are additionals that want to go maybe they could email Georgette which would trigger sure that that she, would if fine. she would know then she could post it just yes, absolutely. I think if one of us sits in the background and doesn't participate it's okay. It is okay to, to sit in the background, but I, I didn't know if there were people that wanted to actively be part of the conversation. I can send a note out, and based on the interest, I can coordinate with Georgette. With Georgette, that's great. Right. And it is, it, it's an exclusion to the open meeting law to discuss dates and what might not over email, that that is permissible, whereas okay. having a policy discussion by email between the five of us would not be. Right. So that's, I'm sure you probably had the fear of Yes. All the ethics it's, it's and everything, everything. everything. instilled they upon you. On oh, yeah. So that that is a good start for us. Looking forward, to, we have a couple of good meetings coming up to look through some of the stuff. Can I make one request? Oh, you especially can. In, as I'm thinking about this, um, whatever it is that gets put on the agenda, I think it's important to have some sort of agenda for that agenda item mm. because I yeah. feel like some of these could be extremely lengthy conversations and good conversations but I think if we're limited yes. to the three or four or five hours that we've been in meetings in the past I feel right. like some of these things could, could be five hour conversations so if we had a specific set of things that we wanted right. to talk about or a goal that we wanted to meet specific to this topic I think that would be really helpful to kind of 
frame it so that it's a 15 minute conversation right. and not a two hour and 15 minute conversation. Excellent, excellent point in that perhaps if there were things beyond that, it could be brought back as a right. business right. in the future. Right, right, exactly. Brought back. A future yeah. meeting. Right, so, until, we, yeah, until we feel good yeah. about it, yeah. Because excellent we need point. to reflect in between conversations. Well, and sometimes there's a need for additional information. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the other thing that I had on here was um, school committee office hours. And I'm bringing this, this is something that the, the school committee did several years ago, I can't even tell you how many, that would hold office hours on a monthly basis. And it was two members of the school committee would go to um, like water fresh or huddles, we could pick any location really, and open it up to the public, to anybody that wants to have questions or just concerns that they want to express to the school committee. Yeah. It my vision, although I'm not, this is not just for me, this is I want everybody to craft what we want to do around this, would be that two members go and that we could put it out on you know social media, which at the time that it used to be done was not as prevalent, so it was not, they were not very well attended. Right, right. My hope in this would be that it would allow people to have access that it's different when they come to the meeting, that they come to the meeting and be, if the item is not on the agenda, there's not as much opportunity for discussion with them or for them to feel it can be intimidating and also to have to sit through two or three hours sometimes is interesting I think we are <laughs> I'm not sure everybody shares that but we could shape that around what so I just wanted to throw that out how people felt I thought we could rotate around so that it's not just the you know responsibility of one or two but it's a great idea yeah. Yeah. And it wouldn't have to be posted. It, you could, it would not it because be it's because it's us. only one or two okay. of us. Okay. It would I think ideally it would be two because yeah. if nobody shows up, it's always better to have a buddy, yeah. um, <laughs> somebody to you know you could get other work done. Mm -hmm. uh, and also because people might come and they might have questions that one of us would know and others would not. Mm -hmm. I think in I did a little bit of research online in terms of what some of the parameters we would want to put around it. One is making sure that people know that while we're there as individual school committee members that the school committee's authority uh, comes from the five of us, not from one or two of us, that yeah, right. in that our ability to influence the outcome on some things is not part of, we're not always able, we don't have, it's not under our purview to do everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they want to be heard and they, I think people want us to know what's going on, even if we can't fix everything. Right. So that would be my, I, I think, Good, if yeah. people, I, I put it in with the hopes that we could vote to approve office hours and then we could maybe look at the scheduling offline um, to, to do that. Good. Nancy, you're full of good ideas. Thanks. Great ideas. Uh, so just one question here. What Did you have any thoughts on how often we would have this? Well, I was thinking we could debut it with once a month, unless other people have other ideas. If it's really popular, I would say we could pick a time between meetings so that there's something that they can follow up on things that were discussed in the meeting or also alternatively things that are coming up before the next meeting. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, I like the debut yeah. idea. I, it also, summer's quieter. I'm not sure that people, I, I yeah. thought it would be nice to try. It's not on their minds right now, but in the I like to think that we're on everybody's minds, but I think realistically not. I not think a lot of people are at the carnival right now <laughs> and not thinking about what we're doing. So would you think waiting until the fall is better or do you think waiting, jumping in and I guess what people... I would think um, August is a good time for new families. That's a great... Um, I also like the idea of a predictable schedule because I think if people can think, oh, second Tuesday of the month is school committee, whatever it is, right. you know, mm -hmm. is school committee open house. Um, I've seen on other districts, often they'll alternate daytime and evening hours. That's, very That's good a great point. Because there are, you know, some people can get out during school and some people have to wait till after work. So just a few things to consider. So... I really like the idea. I if, like it as a, like a listening opportunity, really. I, and I, and to, to the extent that we can redirect to a policy to, to share right. some of the information that isn't always easy to put your fingers on when you're um, a parent, we can help. But a lot of it is listening, and then, if necessary, bringing back to the committee something that we may have heard. I agree. And I think also sometimes connecting to policy, but also connecting with they might not know who the right person in the district to reach out to, that there might be somebody, not, I'm not gonna look at you guys because you're here and call you out on it, but there might be somebody in particular in the district that could answer something that we couldn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so in the 
thinking of doing, because I think you're right, I think if we could do an afternoon and, or morning mm -hmm. and an evening time, do you think it would be better to do both, to do two a month then when we get into the fall and do, do one in August and then when we get into September do one week do a morning and then maybe two weeks after that do an evening? Or do you think we're going to, uh, or I do every other? No. Start with, start with August, and yeah. you know, I think September tends to be such a busy month. Yeah. Well, that's true, a lot of back right. to school. Right, um, so maybe yeah. uh, maybe once a month is okay. a good uh, to aspiration. Start it. So we'll yeah. do whatever we do in August, we can do the opposite in September. September. Yes. And then rotate yes. it. If we have a large interest, we can bring it back here and say, who wants to sign up to do? Right. I think that sounds, that's sounds great. Nice. All right. So I just to, so that I can show on paper that we have full support. I am seeking a motion to approve the holding of regular office hours. So moved. Second. So motion by Mina, second by Meg. All those in favor? Yes. Okay. Any against? Okay. Motion carries. Okay. That moves us into uh, school committee liaisons and roles. Wow. I didn't in. Oh no! I'm sorry. I, it, it's yeah, not bolded properly. This to me it, I am so sorry. <laughs> I think you should take an extra five minutes. How's that? Thank you. I would love that. Um, all right. So, uh, do I press this to there thank you, you wow. Bob? Good work. So, um, we had been looking. Uh, Ashok and I had looked at some of the things that we could do better on the school website, and one of the things that we identified is the school committee menu itself. We had taken a shot at it, um, you know, uh, in fall last year. I had looked at it and come back and sh uh, shared it with Dr. McLeod and, and Ashok. But at that time, we had a lot going on with the superintendent searches and the budget and whatnot. So this was not prioritized. So it's back with the new school committee to take a look at. And, you know, this is just a first cut on high level what the thoughts are. So at a high level, if you have feedback, I can take that back and, you know, we will work on it and we'll obviously have to fine tune some of the things. Again, the idea with the changes on the website is it's the face of the school for people who come to the district first and a lot of parents um, access the school website for a lot of information. So there's some room for improvement there. So the first things first, I don't know if you're able to see that very clearly, is the current location of where the school committee menu is. It is there on the district website. However, it does not uh, persist at school level, right? Also, if you look at it, where exactly is it in terms of location, you know, all, all the menus that we have. So this is one area that we want to make sure that it persists at all schools because many parents directly go to the schools. Um, the drop down menu, I don't know if you're all able to see it. Would you like me to move that board a little bit closer? Can I, is that okay? Thank you, Bob. Uh, it might be limited by cables. But no. I get nervous touching any of the H cam equipment myself. Oh, that's great. It's yes, yeah, it's better. fantastic, Bob, thank you. Um, so if you look at the current menu, um, you know, it's organized a certain way. It seems that it's alphabetical at the moment. So the thought process is to make it seem more approachable. What, what is it that we do in the school committee? Who are we? What are our policies? Um, what is the strategic plan, the budget, the subcommittee, and then our meeting agendas and minutes? So kind of trying to reorganize it and the wording seeming a little bit more approachable, if you will. Right. Also, if you look at it, today we have a separate um, line item for the meeting video stream. That could be rolled into, for instance, the meeting agendas in a minute, and we could provide a link to HCAM. It currently redirects to HCAM uh, page directly. And of course, whenever we make these changes, we want to make sure that, uh, for instance, the town folks who access our meeting minutes, et cetera, they're aware of it. And with regard to the drop downs itself, what is it that we do from a school committee perspective? And I think, you know, uh, Amanda, you had talked about this a little bit. We have a policy on operational goals, and I know we had a philosophy policy, the school committee philosophy, which I think we retired, saying that it's not really a policy. So perhaps we can look at that and talk to, you know, what all our goals, what is under our purview, you know, one of the things that we care about topmost. 
uh, especially after all the trainings uh, that you may have attended. Uh, MSA training student achievement is topmost community's voice, whether it is you know, um, the parent community or whether it is the school community, we need to hear all of that and be part of that in policy, budget, um, superintendent hiring and review, what are the roles, uh, the liaisons, you know, um, I think some kind of a blurb on what is it that each liaison role is, I think that will help people, you know, when we come back with liaison reports. If folks are interested, we, we can post very little bit or we can, uh, you know, go crazy with it. I think one could expand more for something like ESBC, which is a much bigger mm -hmm. uh, committee in itself. And right now we have that set up as its own page and whatnot. So just some cleanup may be needed as things move on. And of course, the strategic plan, how we per, uh, perceive it in terms of our role. So some work around that. Um, so what, we, what I'm seeking here is kind of, is this making sense? Of course, there's gonna be more work after this, especially with the wording and whatnot. Um, and then who we are. Uh, so, you know, these are some samples, if you will. I looked at some other school committee websites. I mean, right now it's very dry. We have our names and, you know, what our roles, et cetera, are. But we could, you know, show some approachability by adding some pictures. Uh, there are folks who have talked about, you know, in other school districts that talk about their interests, kind of showing who they are. Um, or we could post a group picture. I think we got a great picture the other day okay. at uh, Marathon Elementary. And, um, you know, uh, Sharp looking group, you might even say. Yes, sharp sisters <laughs> was the comment I heard. I still have those scissors in my car. <laughs> um, so we could have someone, if we do decide to do this, we can have someone from the district come and take additional photos of all of you and, mm -hmm. and uh, wherever you would like. And Thank, you. Thank you. I think the, the bios are nice. Like it, it, it helps people know who we are a little bit better and makes us seem more approachable if they can see a picture. I'm not a picture fan, but I still yeah. think it's useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then within, you know, the, the, the subcommittees are, some of them are in the main menu, so kind of trying to clean that up, okay. that instead of having, for instance, right now, the athletic field subcommittee and the building projects, they could all be rolled up under subcommittees. So just getting a bit organized. And if there are any other subcommittees which are sizable, where the effort is substantial, that they have their own websites and whatnot, they could be added in there, right? And you know, also in terms of um, the labeling, we just want to keep it consistent. And um, you know, we kind of have to de facto content owner. I was th hoping could be the subcommittee chair. But I think uh, typically the superintendent's executive uh, helps out a lot uh, with the upkeep. Mm -hmm. um, also, on the main landing page, there is a um, there is a place for announcements. I was hoping we could possibly use that more effectively. You know, it talks to policy readings, if you will. There is a building projects tab. I think some of it is outdated. We still have, uh, you know, our previous chair's email address. So some cleaning up and maintenance is needed there. We need to, if we can identify the owner, remove some uh, content, but also in terms of what is it that we want to use this main page for our announcements, right? It could be the announcement of when are we have meeting at Waterfresh, right? Right, mm -hmm. and the, it it seems to have an RSS feed that you know people could subscribe to. Um, so how could we utilize this better? And then there are some other things to talk about. Um, one is the search feature on the policy site, you know, policy page right now. Uh, Ashok and I had talked about this. There are service providers who can host all of our policies, but it seems to be an expensive affair. So we felt that maybe we keep the policies as they are, but provide a search feature so someone, if they want to know, they could search that. Likewise, I was hoping that, you know, even with the meeting agenda minutes, if that's a possibility to look at. Ashok and I haven't specifically talked about the meeting minutes and agenda uh, search, uh, but perhaps something to look at. Sure. Likewise, archiving. Um, you know, what's our policy on archival of some of the information and content? 
uh, the subcommittee minutes. Um, I was hoping that we can also maintain a list of our previous school committee members. I think so many of our volunteers give mm -hmm. so much of their time. Uh, so it would be nice to have that rolling list going uh, yeah. as possible sources of information too, right? Um, likewise, old budget documents, uh, what's the policy around that? Um, and then we need to define some kind of a periodic review and updates, is it every six months or more frequently, because some of the content, you know, we need to be proactive about making sure the content is updated and active. So that's it. Um, in terms of the thoughts around it, of course there's some more work to be done, but I was hoping if there are any comments around this and thoughts, any additions, that come to mind, and I know this is the first time we have reviewed it as a school committee. Um, this need not be the only time you can provide feedback. You can always send that via email. No, I think it's great. It's a, it's a great start, and I think organizing some of that will be really helpful because even just coming on as a new school committee member last year, trying to find some things was yeah. not always an easy process, so streamlining it for the public is, I think, going to be a huge improvement. And I like the idea of archiving. I'm going to look into that and see if what the what the laws say as far as mm -hmm. you know. I'm sure you have to keep it probably forever in the hard copy. But what can we take off the website, or at least put someplace where it's not taking up space where they may want to find other things? So I like. And you did a great job. That's really really good. It's great. Work. Excellent work, Nina. And I'm happy to help if you want someone to assist writing content. Yes, I, I thank you. I would really like that help. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, did you look at the MASC policy hosting? It, it is expensive. Yeah. A lot of districts yeah. use yeah. it. Yeah. What, what kind of effort is involved in making our policies keyword searchable? Is it a big effort? Because um, that's the, well, really the thing that's missing. It would come in combination with us doing a refresh of the, the entire website anyways. I think we're coming to a point where we're looking to refresh the district's website in general if you have a uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and so when we do that, we can add that as an item to check off to make it searchable. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm assuming it would have to be involving a naming convention, making sure that the names and the, the way that the pages or the PDFs are uploaded can be searchable. So there's some work there to be, to be done. That's part of, part of the reason. Sometimes some of the PDFs aren't tagged correctly yeah. in there, and so then you have no metadata to kind of search the, the actual documents or doesn't work as well. So part of it is just in the work of uploading it. But we could, we could definitely look and see. Uh, but I think it would come in a much bigger you know, refresh of the website, you know, beyond just uh, the, well, the, I, think, I think the one immediate thing is to update the, the content that Mina was describing and to, to talk about um, adding the, the changes to the, the school committee channel itself and improving that. I think there should be time to have a bigger conversation about the refresh in general. Um, but uh, Susan and I had some talks about, I think it's the, the company you're referring to was M MASC, it's the Massachusetts yeah. School Committee. It, so, it, so that's a bit, it's bigger than just just getting access, right? It's a, it's more of a bigger commitment. I can't speak to it as well as Susan probably can, but it's a bigger Yeah, I think you had mentioned it is a financial to, commitment. It is, yes. right now. I mean, it, it just depends on what the work effort is on our, you know, just to compare dollars to dollars. If we pay 3500 up front for them to do the cleanup, how does that compare to the cost that we incur by doing it ourselves yes. or with a contractor? So right. on, on that front in particular, the policy hosting, we had looked at both Cambridge as well as Wellesley mm -hmm. utilize mm -hmm. that. So we have a community member who um, is works with the Wellesley Public Schools mm -hmm. and she was kind enough to share some information and. Um, her thought process was it's fairly expensive and not always all that easy. So yeah. we did receive that feedback. I yeah. have the brochure if you want it for their for their service. It came with our training because they were marketing their services. Yeah. yeah. So like I said, that was the feedback coming from someone who's super experienced sure. in that area. Just um, to clarify what you're saying, she's the community member was not in favor of the MASC one specifically or other ones. She was not in favor of the MSC ones. I think there are, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are other requirements beyond cost with that affecting policy, right? It's not just a, I haven't researched it yet, but my understanding is it's not just a hosting service, but you're basically sharing and agreeing to some of the policies, it's my understanding, 
that are hosted there. So there's a, it's a bigger collaborative type approach when it comes to policy making beyond just the hosting service. So I don't think we can simply take all of our policies and have them host it and then get the layout that they have. I think it's a joint collaboration and doing some other things as it, which would change how we do policy internally. So I think mm -hmm. that's the other factor to look at besides just straight up cost. Yeah. Yeah, and Ashok, what we had, at least based on what I had researched, was that there is a certain flavor that could be put in place, but we do refer to the policies of MSC. The, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's um, so it's quite often that we start off, that's the starting place, but then we tweak it to as applicable to Hopkinton. Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, you know, we can involve um, it's Amy Ritterbush uh, who had helped us with all of this, so we can absolutely reach out to her, and she's been very kind in sharing all of that information up front. So we can certainly do that uh, again. Um, with regard to the policy, you had another comment besides the MASC part. I did. I was just, well, I was just curious if we, um, and first of all, this is an excellent endeavor, so I am thrilled that um, you guys are working on this. Um, I didn't know if we had actually had any little focus groups with any parents to find out what they struggle mm -hmm. with because I think we all have struggled it's great. but it's always it's nice yeah. to ask the users mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm just wondering what they would have to say if we if we could have a meeting where we um, just get some feedback on where, where they fall down because it, what's hard for me might not be hard it might be easy for someone else but something else that's obvious to me might be hard for someone yeah. else so. Right. And, and point. Uh, again, you know, in the context of the overall website, we had wanted that, uh, and we had talked about it. But one of the, uh, and you know, we had gotten um, this came up in the community communication group yeah. conversation, and Alexis Miller and Amy Rita Bush, who were representing um, HEF and uh, EHOP, uh, you know, shared their ideas. But the initial thought process was that there are some self-identified issues already, like some of the links and whatnot. And I think Ashok had said, why don't we focus on that ourselves first? And then we get to the place where we form that focus group, yeah. uh, where we can start doing that. But uh, certainly even on the school committee website, I'm hoping to take it back to the community communication group. But if we want to go beyond that, we can, we can certainly do that. Do that as well. I would be curious, you know, families moving into town, they, they go to the school website, they go to the school, they're, they're looking for things. And we've been here for a while, so I'm wondering what new families are looking for that they struggle to find. Absolutely, so I, I've been sweet. there, Amanda. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I completely understand uh, what you're saying. It's, it's a very good point, mm -hmm. very well taken. And if I may, we are, you know, we didn't talk to, with me about, about this with Mina a little bit, but we are in the process of constructing a new parent guide. Um, which will also be in HTML format that we'll add to the website. So, um, and Mina had shared with a couple of different examples. I think one of them was from Cambridge. That's right. um, so we're in the process of making that now, and hopefully within a few weeks we'll have that ready. Yeah. Uh, definitely before the start of school, which will highlight you know things about the basics, like how do I set up a Power School account to here's you know Marathon School and here's the basic facts about Marathon School. So a uh, fact page about each school, facts about registration, facts about setting up accounts. Uh, and so we'll, we'll do that in a PDF format, but also put it on the website and have a few print copies available um, at each of the schools. So that is coming, which will help with that a little bit. And, and I think one of the top things, and I know we are very focused on the school committee page. At some point we had talked about the overall uh, website if I remember correctly, it had come up in one of our meetings in the past. Uh, one of the top priorities is ADA compliance. Correct. That's number one on my list, and that was something we were working on this year. So we do we do have a we do have a, a service that kind of scrubs the website to look at that type of um, compliance for us. And so we started at the beginning of the year, and we were kind of in the sixty percent now for compliance. And so now I think we are. After a year of work, I think uh, at around uh, ninety-six point eight oh, out of hundred hundred for accessibility. Uh, so over the last year, we've done a number of changes uh, on the website. From the, from the basics of fixing broken links, misspellings, um, to making sure that if someone's using a reader, that 
things are tagged correctly, that there's alt tags for images, all that stuff has been going on in the last year. So there's still additional work to be done, primarily with the hundreds of PDFs that we have. Mm -hmm. So the, the work going forward in combination with maybe some talks with people about what we need to change about the website mm -hmm. is to look at the PDF documents and start to make sure that those are all properly tagged so people can, can read those correctly. So, so that's a big thing. So ADA was at, at the top. But other, other things as well, like looking at responsive design. So we need to have uh, move off the template that we're on. So we need to have further conversations about this. Or we're going to start to make a decision about moving from the template that we have, which is not responsive, to a template that is. Um, so that, A, it's, it's better at a number of things. It's better at ADA compliance. It's better at um, translations for uh, other families and a number of areas that we need to improve. So. By moving quickly to a template, uh, some of these issues that we have and things that we're not happy with will automatically start to change. But beyond that, there'll be some work in cleaning out the, the old stuff and, uh, and, and freshening it up a little bit. So, but ADA was one. Sorry. I didn't mean to. Absolutely. So, this is just a small piece of the overall big changes that Ashok is talking about. I just have one other quick comment. Um, which came up in the context of policy, but I think it applies to forms and procedures and other things as well, is, is knowing if, if this is our system of record for something, um, making sure that um, it's consistent. So if, there's, if this is our system of record for policy, so if a question comes up, what's our policy? It's on our website, that's the system of record. It needs to be accurate very quickly after it's changed because that's what's in effect as soon as we vote it. And then it has to be accurate on the district page and on the Hopkins, you know, anywhere that you can get at it, it has to be updated so that parents know, you know, when they're getting a form and they're using a form, this is the current form. The, the forms date, we have a forms database or something that's our system of record. I have no idea what's behind the scenes on this, so I'm just, yeah. you know, from, you know, my, my other life, just wondering if we can keep that in mind as we're looking at the, yeah, the website and maybe the, and if if our system of record is in fact some paper document in a filing cabinet then on our website we need to say here's quick access but our, our actual system of record is in the central office so wherever it is I think whatever the important information is we need to know where the actual source is um, no, I, which I can agree. get very confusing for I, I think part of the change when we look at a new template is really making sure that some of those policies which most of them are in a centralized location but sometimes people relink and we relink them on other pages and that's where the problem is so yeah. if you have an original file an original source and then you link to that original source it should always be the, the right one but okay. sometimes yeah. those other links don't get updated and and so we are struggling with that and looking at that uh, you know the system that we currently have in place is a content management type system where there are multiple people responsible or the idea of it was there are multiple people in multiple departments managing the website yeah. but in reality there are only a few of us really doing that and so we're in the process of we've tried this content management system for seven eight years we've been on on this current system and we have to take a look at it. is this going to be the best approach for how we do it and I'm leaning more towards uh, having someone as more of a dedicated or part-time person managing solely the, the website, which we, which we don't have. Because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it's hard to have that consistency. Someone likes green on this web page and we're not allowed to have green because it's not ADA compliant. So I've got to go back and now change it. And so mm -hmm. there's benefits of doing that, but there's also some control and quality issues that come along with that. Um, yeah. So we're kind of struggling with that and looking at ways to improve that. So. Great. Good you give me more than my share of time. I, you know, that's because I kept skipping over you. No, and it's important stuff, you know, honestly. So that brings us to old business and the school committee liaison and roles that we had started discussing last week. And I tried to update the um, our little chart to reflect what we had discussed. There are still a couple of places where we are looking for um, people who would be interested in being involved in them but and also to say that there will be things that come up as the year goes on particularly if we create any new subcommittees um, periodically we get requests from other organizations outside to have school committee presence that it, this is not like the limit of people's 
interest, but this is a starting point, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So the community communications we had discussed last time, having adding a, if a second person would be interested in working with Mina to do that, um, and you did report on some of that so that I think people have a sense of what it is. Is there somebody else? I'd happily join her. Okay, thank you. I will put down, I'm having issues with my glasses on and off. Mm. I hear that. It's small print for my little eyes. <laughs> Uh, and then the next one is Hopkinton Organized for Prevention, which uh, is Denise Hilbreth is brought this community-wide um, coalition together, and she has been very successful in getting money from the state to bring initiatives into the town to help uh, get education and prevention uh, out there for different substance abuse. So. Uh, that is something that I, I actually am interested in continuing it, but if there's somebody else that would also be interested, she had also said that we could have two people. Um, and if there are two people that desperately want to do it, we can, you know, we can fight it out. That's right. Is there anybody else who's interested? I, I would help you. I mean, I did that as a youth commission yeah. uh, member, and um, I'm fully supportive of Denise and her work in this group, yeah. and I think it's an excellent group and a great cross-section of the community that she brings together. So I would be either an alternate or an addition. If we could go together. It doesn't yeah. have to be either or if that is That's suitable it's to great. the rest of you. Yeah. I, I will if also. You I'm, happy to, I'm happy to stand in if you, if you still want two people, but I think that it'd be great if you want to be sort of the, the primary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I also just want to mention on Denise Hildreth, since we were talking about it, she was uh, at the State House to right. receive an unsung hero award, um, oh, which I thought was oh, fantastic. Right. She has done That's fantastic great. work for she us. She is so a hero. Hero, yes. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it no, is this some, are you, do you want to do it with Amanda? No, no, I don't please, if you are still interested, I'm happy, because I also wanted to mention that the Center School of Use is actually not on this list, ah. and that's me too, at yes. least it for is. now. Yes, is it, it not? Is it? It's under budget it advisory. Under budget advisory. Is. Oh, yes, I added it, it was not on the original one. I'm sorry, okay. And I actually um, already X'd you on there. You did X me. So forget what I just said 10 seconds ago. Um, but yeah, no, I think you and Amanda, absolutely, if you both are interested. And if for whatever reason you need another person and you want to call me, I'm happy to, happy to go. And uh, you know, I just want to be clear that any of these subcommittees that we have, almost yeah. all of them, all the meetings are open to right. public, right. right? Right. They are, but if we're going to participate and there are already two people on it, we need to know ahead of time. that it, mm -hmm. And to be... To attend the subcommittee as an, an observer is different than to be the liaison. Sure. I think is probably the bigger. Mm -hmm. So, but one can go as an observer, right? I, they are open meetings. I think it would be helpful if we're going to each other's liaison meetings to give the other, not just this one, but the other ones, it, because then I think it, it always better to err on the side of caution and post it, okay. even if you don't expect that you'll have any participation. And there's no, there's no downside to posting it. Yeah. Sure. It's okay. That would be my, my thought on all of these. Okay, that's, that's fair. So, uh, and we have the center. So in the planning board is the, another one that we did not decide on the last time. I think given the level of growth that we have seen in, in the town and how that's impacted our schools, I, I think all of these are important to be sure. But it helps to have a liaison to the planning board to have a view of what's up and coming, what is gonna impact our future enrollment, particularly as we're looking at uh, these growing numbers moving up through our grades so that I think that will be vital even if you don't attend all of the meetings at the planning board to follow the agenda to make some contact with the chair or other representative of the planning board and to have a presence there as a school committee so I don't know if there's anybody who is interested I could go I'm look, just looking to see what day it they is. They meet on Wednesdays, don't they? Oh, is it Wednesdays? I don't I know off the top of my head. Monday. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Is that okay? Yeah. Do you want to go? No, that would be great. If it's Mondays, I think we'll call you. Thank you. <laughs> Can't do Mondays. Okay. And they meet only, uh, maybe Bob can advise, uh, once in two weeks. I do think they meet every other week. Generally, yeah. yeah. That's yep. really difficult. Yep. So that, that's good. And I know a couple of years ago, this is before Legacy Farms, the chair of the planning board periodically would come and make a presentation to the school committee uh, that would include not just 
projects that are underway and how it's anticipated to impact our enrollment, but also permits that have been pulled and things that are coming up down the line that we would not be aware of. So I, I do think that's yeah. good communication yeah. to have. Yeah, I know I've signed up, but if anyone else is interested too, you're welcome. Okay. All right. Okay, so in the other one we had talked about was adding another person to the school committee website group to look at that. Um, I don't know, is it? Did, did you already say that? Yeah, I, I volunteered, but uh, yeah. does anyone else want to? Well, well, I, think, I think, well, I, yes, so I was thinking it beyond just, the, and, and certainly you can do both, but I think we're all going to have to help in some way with some of the content specifically, but to look at the work that's being done with the entire districts. So is this going to be just the school committee website? Uh, the, you know, the way it well, to, came up. To work with you uh, in what you're doing on the, the website? website? Okay, fantastic. And, and so then... This is, this is becoming official subcommittee? It is not a subcommittee. It is okay. a liaison to okay. help in whatever capacity okay. is needed. Um, <laughs> whatever capacity your department needs uh, okay. the school committee's help with, but and also to kind of spearhead the piece on what the school committee's website specifically needs to be looked at and to solicit sure. without the expectation that the two people would have to write all the content but maybe could ask help um, oh, well, for whatever you need. And then obviously we'll come back for feedback and you'll get a chance because if you're posting a philosophy or operational goals. If you're I, I think that all should be stuff that we discuss, yes, bring yes. bring back here after you've done some work with it yes. and that we tweak it the way we would a policy. Yes, and, you'll and red mark it first. I might not. I might just love what you have to say and just put an exclamation point <laughs> oh next to it. My. But just to bring it into the public view the yes, same as course. we're trying to do some of, of the other stuff. Yeah. So that is okay. Oh, so. Okay. And I think there was one other thing, uh, which I think is just starting off as the Metrobus Consortium. So that I was thinking was an extension on the work that you and I had each done last year with the legislators. At the, I know you had gone to one and I had gone to one. Right, right, right. I don't know if we if that is something that you want to pass along or what. Yeah, I thought that uh, Amanda had expressed some interest in that, and I don't know if you want to be the main person on that, it, it, it because be, it, yeah. is, it is someone, you know, it's with yeah. the legislators, and it's yeah. a broader group, uh, but maybe we can again post it, and other folks could join in, listen in. Do you want to do that? To, to work on that, it's it, yeah. I don't know. Did you catch the explanation? I did from, but from last time. I okay. Think, and then Mina so yeah. had shared some information on them. So yeah. So okay. there's a meeting coming up, and that's the next, reason why I next didn't week, yes. respond to okay. Kathleen, um, knowing that Amanda had expressed some interest there. I am sorry. I did not mean to. I did not. Was not aware of that. No, piece. that's fine. Okay. Do you um, want to do? It's either going to be on Monday or Tuesday next week. If I think, and if those don't work for you, I can forward the email to you and we can kind of go back to the group to see okay, if they can Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Are there others that... The only other one I had, I don't know, um, we had talked briefly about the Metro STEM Educators Network, which is a, an a collaborative that um, I think is, is sort of was born out of Framingham State and they meet quarterly. And we have a staff staff members right. in the district who go. But, um, they discuss sort of shared concerns, initiatives, what best practices, uh, favorite problems around STEM on a quarterly basis. So I didn't know if you'd given any more thought to having a, a school committee member as an alternate liaison to that. Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why a school committee member wouldn't go. Yeah. I mean, I think. Um, some of the things that the MSEN are doing are amazing and they're great opportunities for kids. And I did meet with Valerie Lachansky after you and I went to that meeting. And um, I, it's really nice to have somebody explain to her all of the things that happened at that meeting when she can't be there. Yeah. So, I mean, it just kind of makes sense that if a school person can't go, that a school committee person would be willing to go. And could they go together if the person was interested in doing it? Yes, yes. Is that absolutely. something? You've been interested it, in it that. It just came up because they run them during the school day. So right. often staff members can't free up a morning. Sure. And, um, right. So I had offered that maybe one of us could be another set of ears for the district. Yeah. I would be happy to be that set of ears I, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> you have more experience in that than I, so I don't know as long as that's okay with it. That's that's, 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 seems like a good match. Yeah. You brought it up. 
Yes, <laughs> you brought it up, so it's yours. You own it. You own it. <laughs> that is the danger of bringing things up. Yep, it's only quarterly, which is nice. Good stuff. Yeah. No, but that's that's uh, STEM is great stuff in our district, and I, I my sense from what I've seen with some of the things that have been going on in our district is some really exciting new things coming forward. Yes. So yeah, we've been working on STEAM for about a year and a half, I think, and we've made great strides, I think. Still, we would talk about it and say we're probably only about 40% of the way where we would like to be, right. but we have done an awful lot of work. But better and than we were a year it's been organic and grassroots yeah. and sort of unfunded, right? All right, so with that, and we will definitely come back to other things as they come up, I would seek a motion to uh, approve the liaison Roles as outlined um, in this discussion here. So moved. I'll second it. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Any opposed? Okay. So that that this carries, and we will come back to it as needed. So then the next thing we have here is the year-end balance report. Ms. Rothermick. Thank you. Um, so what you have is our financial report through June thirteenth. Um, this gives a projection of our potential year-end balance, which at this time indicates a positive variance, which is much better news than where we were back in January. Um, and that's really the hard work and diligence of all the schools in really holding down their spending. Um, but then also in addition, you know, trying to project out long-term subs and leave of absences and, and all that that changes within the, the salary. Um, so this, will con this number will continue to change until we actually close the books. Um, but with this number, we would be able to prepay some of the accept collaborative uh, transportation. And just as a matter of note, the, our, our assessment for next year is that 497,242. So any amount that we can put toward that assessment uh, puts us in a better, a better financial position mm -hmm. for next year. Great. This is mm -hmm. fabulous news. I feel like the graphics should have like exploding balloons, right. and confetti <laughs> falling down. Um, it, it was a little bit dicey there and felt a little dicey from right. where I was sitting anyway about how we would end the year. Mm -hmm. So this is great news. Um, question, the, the accept transportation, is the assessment is based on the FY18 is what we pay in FY19, is that correct or am I? So our assessment is based on the kids that are riding this year. And so right. as students change next year, our cost for transportation does not change. Right. So that's the that's, benefit of having an assessment. So as placements change, as students change, our transportation remains level and then it gets trued up in your assessment the following year. That's, this is very good news. Other um, I just have, you know, I didn't get a chance to circle back with you, uh, Mr. Agamesh. Uh, just a couple of questions. When when you see, um, you know, the percent usage being a little low or high as the year is ending, for instance, on page two, you know, of course, there are some which are small amounts, um, you know, and a few hundreds of dollars. That That's different on page two, uh, the line item from the bottom, the second one, where it is 39% uh, usage. Which page are you looking at? The, um, my projection or the actual MUNIS page? The actual MUNIS report. The MUNIS page. Yes, and the page two where it speaks to the middle school team leaders. Page two. But I'm on this PDF. I'm not seeing the 59. 59. You know, most of them, the usage wise, are over 75% or, you know, closer to 100%. So it seems that from a projection standpoint, the actual, these are fairly close. Right. And, uh, and I know I'm just asking more as a general tracking practice from your end rather than necessarily getting to the specifics because obviously, um, you know, this hasn't, uh, I didn't share this with you beforehand. Um, so the middle school team leaders, when we see that it's a 40% usage from the projection, how is that managed? Something like, something of that nature. So the MUNIS report does not have a projection. 
So the Munis report is your actual. So sure. you, you have to look at the projection, which would actually show that spent out. So I'm looking at the percentage used. So to me, the percentage used is projection to actual, correct? No. Budget, so the budget to actual. Budget to actual. Right. So at this point in time, team leaders hadn't been paid their stipends. I see. They haven't been. Had not. I see. Correct. I see. So, so this is the um, salary is as of exactly that salary. It okay. is not projected out. That's why the first couple of pages are, is my projection, which would show what will happen through the end of June. Oh, I see. So I, I guess we're using the terminology differently. To, to me, when we talk about the budget, mm -hmm. isn't the budget a projection? No, it's not. Well, it is. So the budget is your projection. But then what the Munis report shows is what has been spent to date as of June 13th. Sure, sure. So, but of course I understand that part that it'll continue, those, those numbers keep coming down. Right. But where the numbers in certain instances, you know, are 110%, 120%. When something is a little low, is that something you look at? So, I, well, I do look at that, but that, to give you an idea in particular, stipends are paid at the very end of the year. I see. So I see. in that case where it shows the usage is, is very low, lower. people got half their stipends in December, I January, see. Yeah, I and see. they'll get the rest of their stipend at the end of the year. So that's where your percentage in terms of the salary can be skewed in, in terms of the timing of when those get paid out. Sure, sure. And, um, you know, overall in terms of future planning, and I know this is only your first year, and we all know you, you have, you know, have done so much here, um, you know, in terms of understanding and explaining to all of us too. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, just looking at some of this usage, to me the usage is trying to tell a story, if you will, mm -hmm. that this is what we budgeted or what we thought would be the spend and here's our actual and here's where we went over or we were under. Mm -hmm. So how would you use it into going into the next year in terms of projections? Well, you always look at your final actuals. Okay. Yeah. So where we land when we close a year, you will look at your actuals in terms of looking at your budget going forward. Um, one of the questions that Amanda had brought up as a, for instance, we went way over in legal. Okay. So we did, as the year w was going on, we did see that and we did bump up our budget for legal for next year, but nowhere near the actual that we'll we will come in at because of you know unprecedented different things hitting our legal costs this year. Mm -hmm. So we do always try to look at the actual um, where it lands, but keep in mind that our actual will be actual as of June 30th, and we created the budget back and started in September. Right. So oh, your of course. yeah right. So your adjustment to actual you try to be as, um, you know, forecast as best as right. possible. Right, right, right. Um, and that's why you really kind of look at not, not just this year's actual, but the last five years. So, you know, those budget reports that you get has a couple of years of look back right, right, because right. you can have those anomalies. But if you're consistently under budgeting, then that's an issue as well. Right, exactly. And that's where I was looking at in this particular instance. Yes. And your explanation is helpful in this particular instance. And I remember the conversation around legal a few months back. Mm -hmm. You had brought it up, but that was a concern too. Right. But thank you. Right. But salary especially, there's timing issues. Um, right. So it's hard to look at that report in terms of the percentage usage because of when things are actually paid out in an instance such as stipends okay. or subs. You know, again, it's not just a systematic payment. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right. That's so at the last meeting, you actually already did authorize to prepay, so that was part of this, but this just gives you, you know, the financial report, so you don't need to um, make that recommendation because you did in the last meeting. Correct. That's good. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, and we'll get a final number then at some point just after the fact. When we close just, the books. Just curious, but you're assuming it would be in that ballpark? In that ballpark. Okay. Yeah. 
That's very good news. So it is. Thank you. All right, that brings us to our next opportunity for public comment. <laughs> no, no public comment again. I'm feeling like that carnival's drawing all of our, uh, our people away. Yeah, that brings us then to items by consensus. That's fine. Okay. So as the acting superintendent, I recommend that the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So moved. Second. Motion by Mina, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Any opposed? Okay, so it so carries. Uh, and then that brings us to adjournment. I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. So, motion by Mina, second by May. All those in favor? Yes. yes. All right. You're adjourned. And our next meeting will be on June 28th, 2018. And I believe that has been moved. Is that correct? The afternoon? It's to at 2.30 to to in the afternoon, uh, with it starting with an executive session and then going into a special meeting at 3 o'clock in the central office. And I will um, look forward to seeing you all there. And thank you all for everybody in our audience. And have a good night.